Hey, I'm Sith King. And I'm Sonic Sons. We're the Rambling Reviewers. And today we're looking at How to Train Your Dragon 3, The Hidden World. No, 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 no. I think it's important that it's just The Hidden World, no 3 here. Oh. Which, I mean, okay. Yes, technically this is the third movie in the How to Train Your Dragon series. That being said, it didn't really feel like a sequel to the other two. Um, I mean... It was in a way but you're right you could almost swap the order of two and three and just as long as hiccup's dad was alive again everything else would kind of be similar i mean okay i guess the ending except for the part yeah no the end different but like this felt tonally this could have been like a four episode mini series part of the cartoon just yeah that's what you're trying to say okay not the time slot right yeah the others had like a sense of gravitas and a sense of well, this had gravitas too, but I'll t- all right, yeah. My general impression is, first off, I wish I'd seen it in theaters because it looks like it'd be really beautiful on a true big screen. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, and we also saw it via YouTube purchases and linked it up to a TV and it sort of stuttered here and there. <laughs> okay, With yes. animation this good, you want it all the way up. Right. Um, and, you know, it had some, some great themes at the end there about dealing with change and moving forward in life and uh having to let a friend go off and, and have their own life and that sort of thing it was kind of touching and i still at the same, at the same time was feeling like they could have built up to this better actually <laughs> okay the an end okay you were correct it had these themes of those things that you were saying But the problem is that when you have a story like this, it's like Neon Genesis Evangelion, like a reboot of Evangelion 3 point whatever, 33333, infinitely repeating there. Um, It makes you feel those things, but there's, at the same time, there's a part of you that's going, but why though? (laughs) But but why? I mean, it was- Why is this part necessary? Less confusing than Ava. Okay, yes, Very few things are more confusing than Ava. It was less confusing, (laughs) and I'm just saying that the emotional scenes were emotional, but like- It didn't make sense. (laughs) It's not just that it didn't make sense. If it- This- It made- It made artificial sense, if that makes sense. I mean, okay- what I mean by that is, it makes sense in terms of the story structure, but it didn't feel natural. Right, because it means the logic that... behind it didn't force that conclusion. Correct. Yeah. Okay, um, so... The start of the beginning? The start of the beginning. Uh, mm-hmm. Hiccup and friends raid a ship that's got some captured dragons, because there are evil warlords out there who capture dragons yeah uh, so that's cool they fight those people yeah see this is a thing that's kind of bugged me about this film and the last one are these canon with the cartoon the netflix series or the cartoon network show because if so this was kind of a letdown and i'll give my thoughts on that as we go on but yeah, i don't know nothing about the cartoon so you'll have to inform me i, I watched every episode all right <laughs> And for some reason, I remember this that better than Babylon 5 at the moment, which is really sad, because he's been catching up on Babylon 5. Yeah, so 5. suddenly I know tidbits that he forgot, like what happened in which season. Well, yeah, you know, it's been like a year or two since I've, several years since I last saw it, and you watched it yesterday, so. Yeah, yeah, so well, it gives me the advantage. Anyways, let's continue so, on. So, uh, they fight off the dragon, um, capture guys, whatever those are called. Dragon trappers. Dragon trappers, that's right. Um, and bring their newly freed dragons back to Burke, which looks awesome and is also kind of crowded because there's a whole lot of dragons. Yeah, and they uh, say, Hiccup says, oh, dragons can come here. It's a utopia for dragons. You don't have to work or worry about anything, which I just have to go, okay, there appears to be more dragons than people here. I can't imagine having this much megafauna in a concentrated area has done wonders for the amount of food in the immediate area so yeah i can only assume they're getting a daily shipments from somewhere <laughs> yeah anyways and so and then uh hiccup thinks well all right so there's a plot where what's his name is jobber yeah, uh, yeah. which character are you talking the about? dude with the more prosthetics who's all like that's you should get gobber. married that's right. gobber 
Um, he's like, she saw these little bits, uh, Hiccup and Astrid, she get married, and they're kind of like, oh, we're not ready for that. But they're clearly dating already, so it's not like a huge leap when they do get married by the end of the film. Which, okay, <laughs> welcome to the first installation of the cartoon, Show That This Is Weird. And welcome. Uh, the cartoon, specifically Riders of Burke, I mean, wait, no, wait, Race to the Edge, showed this the episode where... Hiccup and Astrid confessed, not only confessed to each other, but also the episode where they got engaged. <laughs> so they're already fiancés at this point. Oh. And the cartoon and, and Race to the Edge happened before the second movie. And the second movie was a year ago by this movie's own admission. So they've been fiancés for over a year and they don't feel like they're ready to get married. Maybe yeah. this is a Viking thing, but... I doubt it. But, um, last time, maybe it's just like a promise ring where, you know, you promise to get married to someone. Honestly, though. Or the, I could not know what, what a promise ring is. Well, no, a, a promise ring is like a halfway engagement. It's like, let's let another step along the path, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but, yeah, I get the impression that they were trying to thread this needle in which they could be engaged as, the, as of this movie and yet we don't have to acknowledge the engagement because if we did, then uh, the people who haven't watched the cartoon show would be all confused. Like, why didn't I get to see the proposal, right? So that's why I would imagine. That's why they was phrased it as, you two should get married, which can be taken as you've been engaged for a while, hurry up and set a date, versus uh, you clearly like each other and you should have a relationship or a marriage. Um, and that, I'm guessing, sort of hamstrung the writers a bit because a they had to write the dialogue vague enough so that Astra could say something like, we're not ready for that, and I'm interpreting it as, you know, our relationship isn't that solid, and for people who've seen the cartoon, they're supposed to interpret it as, you know, we just haven't made the plans for the ceremony? <laughs> But, like, when you have yeah, to be vague... Yeah, because Vikings seem like the type that are super careful at planning and not the type that are hyper-impulsive like they're showed every other instance. Right. Okay, no, I, I get that I'm looking for nitpicks here, but but this... But it, it... It's like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, you want to see all these various myriad plot threads come together. And then you want to also make room for people that miss some of the movies. Right. Or the TV show, in this case. Which... Mm. Yeah, because if, because you know, I, was, I did I was, see some TV, some cartoon originated dragons come from here, and that's another thing that we're going to talk about. I assumed, as I'm sure all the other people who haven't seen the cartoon have assumed, that they weren't engaged, um, and that the development was about them deciding that they would, you know, work well as a married couple, which we didn't get as much of that as i might like and part of that may be time constraints and part of that may be oh for those of you who watched the cartoon they already made that decision so we can't have them propose twice uh so that was just a, was a little hollow yeah it's not horrible it just could have been more yeah just the, all the interactions feel a little off like they were written by the writers of a cartoon Rather than the guys who wrote the previous films. That may be. I haven't seen the previous films in a while, so I'm a little hesitant to draw comparisons, but it may be. Yeah. Also, I've never seen the cartoons. Um, uh, I'm pretty they sure be. they replaced... Oh, a quick note. I'm pretty sure they replaced T.J. Miller with another guy, or T.J. Miller did all his lines for Tough Nut before he got hashtag me too and basically his career was over. I wouldn't be surprised if they record a long way in advance because they do like performance capture and stuff. So yeah. they need that for the animation people and all that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, in What the Hell moments, apparently Snotlout has a thing for Valka, Hiccup's mom. What? Why? Okay, let's let's leave aside the fact that I went on basically an hour-long rant about how much I fucking hate Valka in the review of How to Train Your Dragon 2. And I, some of I mean, might... that's going to come up a little bit more here, actually, in some of the flashbacks. I'm going to have to comment on it. Yeah, so you might be thinking that I may have changed my mind about her since it was several years ago that we reviewed How to Train Your Dragon 2. And my anger towards Valka and how she left her family to be with the dragons and become more understanding of their wants, needs, and desires and hope to achieve peace between them... 
I might be able to understand that more. You would, of course, be wrong. No. I still fucking hate. <laughs> I still fucking hate her, and I hope that she explodes. I uh, know. Honestly, like, I, even... I just have to headcanon it the whole time because we 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 told her in that review. We we're like, look, just make it so that she thought they were, her family was dead, and therefore went off to live her own life because there was a horrible misunderstanding. That would have worked. Okay. Didn't give us that. Right. But even providing a more generous interpretation of Valka, why does Snotlout want to marry her? Yeah. I mean... He's not interacted with her at all. Why? It's also an unusual age gap, but even putting that aside, okay, has not really interacted with her at all. Okay, uh, generally speaking, Vikings did not... Uh, people in more... You know what? No, just... You're not going to get into the history no, of that, yeah. No, all of this is just... It just felt tacked on, if nothing else. There was no reason for it. It's like they had to give him lines. He had to do something in this movie. So. Which, it, again, the cartoon actually gave him character development, moving him from, well, a cowardly jackass, who was basically the reason most of their plans went wrong, to someone who at least had a conscience and that Hiccup was starting to understand the reasoning behind why he was the way he was. Hmm. Now, admi- now, I am kind of glad that they got rid of the rough nut, fish legs, snotlout love triangle, but they replaced it with snotlout pining after a much older woman who can't give him children. Which, I given mean, how obsessed with, you know, family snotlout is supposed to be, um, no. I mean, I'm not saying that a woman's only role in life is right, to give birth. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, just that at that. this particular age in history, with the technology and health concerns that they have, right, well, it would be much more important than, say, in our modern society. Yeah. Uh, but even putting aside Viking culture, because who knows how accurate they are with that, uh, Snot Loud doesn't seem to have any reason to have a personal connection with her yeah he doesn't like she's not one of the the team either you know like you're just talking about the love triangle thing like someone he's interacted with through three movies and like this might plausibly be a thing and yeah it's just kind of that's you know at least when there was the love triangle with rough nut it was because she was one of the only females his age who was also a dragon rider yeah that at least there was logic behind it and they spend a lot of time together, so you might potentially develop feelings, you know. Right. But here, it's he has this weird not-love triangle between Eret, son of Eret, who is still criminally underdeveloped from the last movie. Oh, I forgot he was in the last movie, jeez. <laughs> yeah, and Valka. So, except that she... Valka, at the end, implies that she might have, like, a tiny fraction of feelings. Yeah, I'm or at least that was compliment. more of just gave him a compliment, less so starting up romance with Which, him. Okay, if it was that way, then I'm okay with it. But on the other hand, we had this whole scene where Stoic was sobbing into the fireplace where he was saying, Your mother is the only woman I will ever love. Uh, there will never be another that I will fall for. So that just kind of feels like a slap in the face, just a little bit. Well, I don't think, again, she was starting a romance with him. But no, I, if I his, agree. If Snoutlap's thing is that he's going to have this unrequited love for somebody, let his character arc be learning that she doesn't love him back, but uh, that's okay, and he can still, like, you know, have pride and, and a chance for meeting someone else in the future. And right. back to the cartoons, he actually was rejected several times by other women, and he took that semi well. Okay. If, I mean, he was still kind of a dick, but you know, less of one. Right. Well, see, this would fall in right with this idea of embracing change and letting the people in your life be who they are and take their own paths in life instead of forcing them into it. You got Hiccup and a Toothless, and Hiccup's got to let Toothless go. We'll discuss that later. But the theme of it is you got to let people go. You can't control them. So if you have an unrequited love thing, have a likewise be of, oh, I realize I'm not the person for you. I was just being weird about it and imagining stuff that would never have worked, and I'm sorry, and you do your thing, and I'm going to go find my own path. That would have been a parallel moral. Mm-hmm. We never, he didn't really develop that way. He never like had a revelation about it. He it, just finally got a compliment at the end of the movie. This was just a thing that he did. Yeah. And it just kind of happened over the course of the movie. 
But wow, we we haven't even covered like the second scene of the movie. Not really. Um, okay, so their Burke is different. Um, uh, Hiccup for some reason isn't hanging. I mean, Fish Legs isn't hanging around with Meatlug as much, but is instead you know carrying around Meatlug's baby, Meatlug the dragon, his, yeah, his yeah, personal yeah. dragon. Um. Then suddenly, um. Well, okay. Finally, he just leaves. Wait, hang on. No, 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 no. no. Right. Okay. Hiccup they're in the, is they're talking to himself about maybe they could find a hidden world at some point. Uh, the hidden world, they have a flashback to Stoic the Vast talking to Hiccup and talking about how it's the homeland of all dragons and how Stoic wants to seal up the entranceway to the hidden world so that humans and dragons can live separately and there won't be any more fighting between mm-hmm. the two. Um, and Hiccup is starting to want to look for that even though I thought one of the things that he had to undergo in the last film was that he had to accept his responsibility and not run away from it. I mean, he's running with the rest of the tribe, so it's more of a migration than a runaway. Well, but he doesn't do that until later, but he's... Well, I thought he... he, No, he mentions to Astrid, like, well, and all of us could go there. Like, he didn't just say you and me. Hmm. Um, But it wasn't clear why this would be, like, a pressing issue. Um, And then Toothless runs off, and he finds Light Fury, who has no name. Yeah, a Light Fury. A Light who, Fury. Who's basically a feminized version of Toothless with white white skin. Right, it's a girl Toothless. Yeah, um, which is weird because this appears to be a separate species from the Night Fury. So just, be, just because it looks similar does not mean that it's actually similar. I, I would call it sexual dimorphism, right? Like in ducks, the males have the bright colors and the females don't. You know, they're still the same species. Right. So I have to assume true, that but was there's the all... intent here. Hmm. 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 But when the children are... When Toothless's children are born, they're black and white, which, given that the Night Fury is supposed to blend into the night sky as a defense mechanism... Maybe the Light Fury flies in the sun? Hmm. You know, I, don't, I don't know, but enemies. anyways... So they find this light fury just within a spitting. Oh wait, no, no, no. Sorry, we missed another scene. God damn it. That's We're... okay. There's just so much to talk about here. We're taken to this place that's somewhere in the east, where there's a fortress, and this guy lands on what appears to be one of those four rotor drones, except replace the helicopter blades with dragons. Yeah. Um, and this guy looks like anorexic Draco Malfoy. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. Um, he his name is. <laughs> We're uh, looking it up. Grimmel the Grizzly. Yeah, well, and Grimmel honestly, the I this guy is supposed to be the main antagonist of the film. Oh yeah, just say Grizzly. Sorry. Yeah, here's the thing. He's basically every hunter character you've ever seen in fiction. We could have replaced him with Clayton. From Tarzan or Craven from Spider Man, and you yeah. wouldn't have noticed a damn thing. I mean, he's a few notches more aristocratic than Clayton, but uh, yeah, he's sort of vaguely motivated by the thrill of the hunts and uh, goes around hunting stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, and he is talking to some trappers who have unique character designs and unique voice actors, so we know they should have some impact on the plot. And they don't. <laughs> but really, all that matters is that they want the dragons that are in Burke, but they have a Night Fury, which is interesting to uh, Grimmel. God, I can't even remember this guy's name. Okay, we'll just keep up the page here. <laughs> well, Grimmel is really interested in hunting Night Furies. For some reason. We'll get to this. Mm-hmm. Anyways, um, so he agrees to take the Night Fury, capture them. Well, to take the Light Fury they currently have to go and cap- use it to capture the Night Fury, which exists on Burke. And they acknowledge that Toothless is now the king of the dragons. That's cool. Well, a king of the dragons. So if they get Toothless, they can get all of the other dragons who follow Toothless. Right. Which, okay, that's continuity from the last film. I like it. Very well done. Well done, movie. So when the light fury shows up, you know something's up. And and what was up? Because like, did Grimmel just carry her over in a cage and drop her off nearby? I, I think that is the implication because there was like a partially emptied prank dart. Oh yeah. So she must have woken up, and then Toothless shows up. 
Yeah, and then there's a trap that's nearby that somehow no one touched or interfered with in the whole the dragons are romping around and looking at each other scene until Hiccup goes up and he pokes it and it slams uh... shut. Which credit where it's... Oh, wait, no. wait, no, she like ran off. So they weren't doing a whole lot of romping in that scene. The scene with the romping was on Okay, beach. right, next. But... And the point of this scene was to make Grimmel seem like a master strategist because he knew it would force all of Burke to leave Burke. And well, they, yeah, there's a second part to that, but it is it is still going to be weird. Okay, so you let's set up a trap that I guess was designed to fail, or maybe like if it succeeded, that's great, and if it doesn't, that's great too. So the Xanatos style, which would be nice. Um, but uh, they they defeat the trap. And uh, by throwing a stick at by it, throwing a stick at it, yeah. Well, he well, senses the trap, notices the trap, uh, and so then Hiccup goes back to Burke and tells people, Hey, someone slipped through our defenses, and that someone is Grimmel. Uh, Eric informs us because he knows the design of this dart. And Grimmel's a scary guy, we're told, Eric, not, not Eric, Eric, E R E T. Oh, Eric, son of Eric, oh, okay. no, Eric, son of Eric. Oh, okay, because I know Eric Erickson is a Okay, it's well. a joke now. Okay, I get it. Point is, uh, then we see Hiccup in the night in some hut going over his father's old books about uh, clues as to where the hidden world might be when suddenly Grimmel shows up and he shoots a tranquilizer dart into what we believe to be uh, sleeping toothless, toothless under a blanket. And he monologues a bit about how he's totally going to capture slash kill this Night Fury. Even though the Night Fury is right there, and you probably could have fired like five or six more darts into Toothless and killed him instantly. Right. Yeah. So why why didn't you kill? Why don't you just shoot him? It is very much in play here because. Uh, okay, well we'll get. I, to... I guess he wants to kill a Night Fury and also earn a lot of money from these other dudes. Well, I, I think he's after like the hunt, but you found him. The hunt is over. So... Yeah. Or unless he already knew he hadn't found him, but this is. I mean, that gets weird because, okay, so that turns out, all right, take up and plan for this, and it's not uh, Toothless Under the Blanket. It's Fish Legs. It's Fish Legs. Like, so, like, aha, we have you surrounded, and then Grimmel's like, aha, I have you surrounded because I have two giant dragons just sitting in the rafters that nobody noticed. Yeah, or, oh, and also, um, the rest of Burke is on fire now <laughs> because no one noticed that either. Seriously. They okay. trying well, to make Grimble into like a tactical genius, which would be great, but his tactics make no sense to me. How did he sneak these two damn things into the rafters of a building during a stakeout mission when there were like five people awake in the shadows? Yeah, and like, watching the building. And watching carefully. the building. <laughs> he didn't I, have a clever plan. It was just like the writers said I have dragons now. Poof. <laughs> okay, and okay, I could admit I could see a scenario where he gets the dragons in because there's tons and tons of dragons here already. Fine. How did none of the heroes note that the rest of the village was on fire? I don't... I, How did they not notice that? Given that, generally speaking, Burke should have a very good fire suppression system by now. <laughs> I'm, not even, I'm not going by cartoons. I'm not going by the other things in co the continuity. I'm saying that the first time we see Burke is in the middle of a dragon attack. And then from then on, dragons are living there. Having a good fire suppression system in a town filled with dragons and is primarily made out of wood is like a basic necessity. Okay. Now, to be fair, we only saw a brief shot of the outside fire. It wasn't clear if it was more than two buildings, and it was never implied the whole damn thing you know, burned to the ground. Uh, but yeah, that one basic shot gave us a little confusion. Like, wait, what is the situation out here? How much of the site is burning, and when was it lit on fire? I can only assume just now, but wasn't super clear. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Hiccup says that we need to go to the hidden world, which I don't know where it is. So I have the best plan <laughs> ever. We're going to get everyone, load them onto Dragonback, and fly to the hidden world, which I don't know where it is. <laughs> Even though, like, the option of me going out with just my friends and mapping the area where the hidden world would be and then coming back so, you know, we know where we're going, <laughs> we're going. would be a great idea. Which is exceedingly dumb because 
Welcome back to The Cartoon Made It Less Confusing. Or The Cartoon Makes It Confusing. Whichever one more fits this situation here. Um, because this was the premise of Race to the Edge. That there was a whole world out there that they didn't know about. So Hiccup and his friends went out to go on scouting missions to identify all the new islands, find new dragon species, and identify potential threats to Burke. And now the map is empty again, at least to the west. Well, the reason I mean, I'm saying I'm not saying that okay, they're Vikings. They're not going to have the most detailed maps on the sure, planet. Sure. I mean, granted, they were a great seafaring culture, and yes, they probably would have really good maps. And you figure that the waterfall at the edge of reality would be an important thing to mark on your map if you're in a boat <laughs> yeah uh, but i'm just like why don't you do that take your friends go off there while the rest of burke sits here in relative safety with their giant flying fire breathing war machines of death not to mention all the other weapons that vikings traditionally carry turtle up there and wait for any idiot to come and you know try to attack you Meanwhile, Hiccup and his friends scout the route ahead of time to make sure we know where we're going. But no, they don't do that. They make a mass migration with no destination in mind. Which, for anyone who wonders how badly this could be, please see Battlestar Galactica 2003 <laughs> for an idea. Hint, it ends badly. Yeah. Um, so... Although I did miss... I, maybe Daniel was like... Daniel Cylon Model 7 was actually a dragon. That would be awful. <laughs> no, wonder, no wonder John killed them off. Uh, he was jealous. <laughs> okay, I get not making me a machine. Fine. Why couldn't you give me fire breath and wings? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So, the idea here is that Grimmel is a mastermind who has manipulated them into making the wrong move. But his plan depends on them making a bizarre and rather stupid move. Yeah. So really what you're telling me is the heroes are stupid and less so that the bad guy is intelligent. Um, he mentions that they've abandoned their only defensible position. I don't know how this movie defines defensible. Normally, yes, if you are being attacked by people on boats, it's nice to be up on the top of a cliff face somewhere where raiders cannot easily jog up to where you are. But in a world of freaking dragons, uh, everything is open to the sky. You have no bunkers or something to defend against aerial attacks. And if you do, so... you still have roughly a thousand dragons. Yeah, that too. But the point is, th those dragons come with you. So the location is not any more or less defensible. It's the dragons yeah. that protect you. They also mention the new place they go to, Newburgh, is also defensible when they settle down there. And you're like, this is... Equally defensible to any this other place. This looks exactly the same as old Burke. It's just like more landmass, which is good if you're a crowding problem, but I don't know what else we're talking about. Yeah, and the only crowding problem we saw was the dragons, and that problem gets taken care of at the end of the movie, so why didn't they move back? Wait, you never, never mind. Yeah. We're, we're not there yet. Okay. Uh, and everyone's like, yeah, we should settle down here. Even though Hiccup is like, no, 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 this is just until we get to the hidden world. Yeah... Also, Grimmel has this scene where he's explaining how smart he is to his uh, uh, people who hired him. Uh, pro tip to you aspiring supervillains. Actually, no, ignore this advice if you're an aspiring supervillain. Everyone else pay attention, because I want you <laughs> aspiring supervillains to die. <laughs> when you look like you weigh 90 pounds soaking wet and have bone structure that looks about as sturdy as that of a canary, maybe don't deliberately piss off people who look like they bench press semis for a living. Yeah, that was a thing. Who are in full plate armor and have deadly weapons. Right. I'm just saying, your life expectancy will increase. <laughs> so, the way this goes is he explains the Night Fury, you know, and crew won't go north because it's too cold, I guess, at all times of year. Um, and they have enemies to the east and south, therefore they will go west. And uh, Night Furies aren't long-distance endurance flyers, therefore they'll have to make pit stops along the way. Therefore, they will have had to head to the west. And I'm like, okay, but how do you know which specific island they're going to land on? I guess there's yeah. only one serviceable island, but you'd have to know he was taking the entire village with him and not doing anything else he plausibly could have done. And then, as you were alluding to, he does this weird thing with the with the other guys. Like, hey, so which way are they going? 
what, what, what? And he's like leading them to say West, and they're all like too stupid to get it. And I'm like, again, this is making Grimmel. It, it's mental that Grimmel looks smart. It's making everyone else look weirdly stupid that they couldn't figure out West when you've already eliminated North, East, and South as East. options. Oh, I thought yeah, yeah, because the guy I says it. Said, yeah, I yeah. thought you said West. Uh, You're fired again, Patrick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes sense for Patrick to do it, but that's a comedy thing, and this is meant to be making Grimmel all scary. Yeah, and furthermore, the cartoon again. Burke has allies, Defenders of the Wing, the Berserkers, the Outcast Tribe. All of these would probably be willing to help them, and I don't recall them existing specifically to the east. Or Burke mentioning having enemies to the west. I mean, they don't have enemies to the west. I mean, enemies to, to the, the east. west. I don't remember Burke having enemies mentioned in the cartoon but i do remember them having at least three groups of allies they could have called upon in times of need yeah. and hell maybe they could have just moved to like an island that's near the defenders of the wing or or any of their other allies instead of oh i know for a fact that they're going to go to the hit go to this direction and this specific set of islands why why, why do you know that for a fact? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing stopping them from just going a little bit north or yeah, a, little a little bit, bit south. south. I mean, it's not like the Vikings were a warrior culture and could <laughs> probably invade their enemies and take their land. You know, yeah. Especially if they have an armada of flying, fire-breathing war machines. Right. Why did no one propose this during that meeting? They're like, hey, uh, so someone invaded our turf and burnt down two of our buildings? Let's kill him and all his friends. And that should be the how it should have ended. Is all the dragons just going, ah! Like, I know that Grimble had a lot of guys, but you could kill some of them. You could try? I don't know. Something? Yeah, so anyways. And then, and then again, they need to... They're spooked at Grimble having shown up, and instead of just boosting security around here so random people can't just sneak in... They want to go to an entirely new place that they're not familiar with because that will make it easier to boost security against random people sneaking in. Yeah. Shrug? Okay, look. Optimus Prime was criticized for his plan of the Autobots abandoning Cybertron. But to be fair, that was after 10 million years of war and the planet was literally dying underneath them. It's understandable when he said to do it. You know, the when, head... yeah, when Bur Burke seems fine, there is no reason for them to all leave. Like I said, just if you want to go to the hidden land, send out your friends while you be chief and you take care of this stuff. You know what feels like happened or should have happened rather uh, is let's say we introduce magic because we have dragons already. So easily enough. Um, and Grimmel's got some magic to bring up, like, a freaking volcano under Burke and just nukes the place. And there's, like, this rapid evacuation of, holy shit, our town is completely destroyed, and we kind of look back at the ashes of the whole thing, you know, it's, in, it's all in flames or it's all charred to nothing, it's, and we're airborne, and we're like, okay, crap, we need to go find a new home right now because our old one is dead. Yeah. And that would also establish Grimmel as being scarier. I think another problem with Grimmel is, welcome back to the cartoon made things more confusing. The cartoon had some great villains, including ones that actually thought tactically. Mm. That were actual um, Xanatos-type geniuses. Um, Vigo. Wait, no, no, no. Wait. Was Vigo? Wait. 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 What was the bad guy in the second one? Know, it's been a while. I'm gonna find out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh wait, no, no, okay. Vigo, Riker, Johan, Krogan. Yes, his name really is Krogan, my Mass Effect fans. But all of those guys thought tactically. They at uh, when when Hiccup made Vigo Bloodfist. Yeah, there was an arc in the in the cartoon where. Okay, where Riker decided to... No, I am not making that up. His name actually is Riker. Okay. Um, where Riker decided to sign a peace treaty with Hiccup. Now, being the smart people that they are, the group immediately thinks, oh, this is a setup for a plan. And they see where 
uh, Riker wanted a line that would restrict his activities to above this line and Hiccup and his group would be below this line. They see an island that is barely in their ter- in Riker's territory, indicating that he wants it because of how they know how he thinks. But he's thought ahead because that island is full of the defenders of the wing who are super hostile to dragon riders because they think they enslave them. Oh. So, and while they're there dealing with the defenders of the wing, he sneaks in and steals the defender of the island, the Eruptodon. We'll get back to that later because it's, again, kind of freaking important. But that's the kind of thinking that works because it, it doesn't make both sides. It makes both sides look smart. <laughs> Rimmel's brand of tactical genius revolves around him magically knowing that the uh, heroes will make stupid decisions, not noticing that their town is burning down or immediately evacuating at the first sign of trouble. Those are silly decisions and not very reasonable ones, ones that we can pick apart rather quickly. Riker's move, on the other hand, made use of the fact that Hiccup and his group knew Riker and they were and it planned around both his act they planned around Hiccup knowing what Riker would do and then how Riker knowing that Hiccup would know what Riker would do. Exactly. So, yeah. And that allowed him to get away with his evil dastardly scheme. That is a good tactical genius. When you can see how and why the person laid out what they wanted to do, instead of just assuming because of magic what they're going to do. This is why we like Thrawn, because we can understand why Thrawn does what he does. Yeah, Thrawn was very good at what he did. But instead of turning this into yet another session of us masturbating over how awesome Thrawn is, I mean, granted, he is awesome, but let's, <laughs> let's stay on track. Let's stay on track. Speaking of which, I should, we should really watch Star Wars Rebels sometime because he actually shows up. Oh, I hope he lives up to the books. Um, sort of, yeah. Okay, that's From cool. what I've seen, yeah. Okay. Uh, anyways, that's why I'm disappointed with uh, Grimmel because he doesn't live up to a TV cartoon. Yeah, you think that the best writing would be in the movie with the more budget. What's What makes Grimmel and this whole thing worse is... That the whole thing is based around dragon trappers, to a degree, and the control you have over the dragons. Except that Vigo and Riker and Krogan and Johan were all working with dragon trappers. The whole thing was a conflict between Hiccup's forces and the dragon trappers the entire time. And they actually had to come up with a defense against arrows that would knock dragons out which makes it kind of strange that they have them in this one and everyone acts shocked and surprised that they have this sort of stuff yeah clearly it's not in continuity it's gone too far from the rails yeah and there's just like a lot anyways but anyways they settle on the island of new burke which is completely different from old burke because shut up Mm. And Toothless tries to do a mating dance to the Light Fury because he ran away and he acts like an idiot. And he does. There are some nice callbacks. Like we see the Light Fury hanging upside down by her tail, like Toothless did back in the first one. Um, and hey, is the Light Fury remotely necessary to Grimmel's evil scheme? Fate. But in what way, though? Like, oh, except near the end. That's right. That's what becomes important. But early on, when he lifts her onto the island of Burke, right? And. And then she just flies away, and then he shows up at Hiccup's house. He could have just showed up in Hiccup's house anyway. Like, the Light Fury yeah. had no impact on that plan. Oh, man. God damn it. <laughs> like, what was, what was the point of that? What was the point just of to that? to hope he would stumble into that one stupid trap that he was clearly going to notice anyway? Uh, uh, okay. Any, so. I honestly thought for a while there that Grimmel's plan would involve he wants to find the hidden world for some reason. And, like, only the King of the Dragons can access it? Because I assumed it wasn't just off the side of the map. I thought it was, like, in another dimension or something magic and weird. Um, and so he had to let Toothless live long enough to make that happen, you know, so he could get there. And that, that wasn't his plan, it turns out. He doesn't care at all about the hidden world. Yeah, it's... <laughs> now that I think about it, yeah, the, the life theory is completely unnecessary to the plan. In fact, we could have skipped it altogether. 
It becomes necessary only at the end when he's got Toothless and Light Fury chained up, and he can threaten Light Fury's life in order to make Toothless cooperate, which is only necessary so he can bring back the dragons to the other trappers. So I, we're skipping. So we can apparently betray them. We're, we're and, skipping uh, we stuff skipping again. Stuff. But right. uh, so Toothless, it turns out, can't fly on his own, which is... You know that, right? That's yeah. from the first movie. Yeah. They do... And here's the part that really annoys me is because I don't know what's co in continuity or not. Because they mention, oh, because when Hiccup sees, oh, you need to be able to fly on your own in order to woo this female, the, the Light Fury, he starts building a tail that would allow Toothless to fly on his own without any outside assistance. Except that Astrid mentions that you did this before and Toothless rejected it. Which references the Gift of the Night Fury episode. Oh. Which, I mean, granted that was a special and not part of the cartoon series itself. But it means some of the stuff that's out there oh, is in continuity. And we just have to guess what is. <laughs> which is really... Because they have fireworms later on and Astrid reaches up to touch them. Fireworms are from the cartoon as well. They originate from the cartoon. They're not from the movies at all. Except here's the thing. They burn with the heat of... They burn like red-hot coals when you touch them. In fact, there were episodes dealing with street migrations of these things that would land on islands and burn them to cinders. So why the hell is Astrid reaching up to touch them? No, and yeah. that's that's upsetting to me because it means some stuff from the cartoon is in canon, but we're not telling you what stuff is or not, <laughs> so we can't tell you what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Jeez. Uh, but so, anyways, the Hiccup constructs a second tail and Toothless flies off, and then Hiccup acts really surprised that the wild animal that's lived with him for years would leave when he's near a mate. I mean, he's not exactly surprised as he is sad and hopes he'll come back. Yeah, it's that. just... Okay, so Toothless flies off with Light Fury, who and, needs a name, for goodness sakes. And that's his contribution for the most of the film, actually. he just He's just not here. Uh, but eventually... Well, when he's off with her, I should mention, she, A, teaches him to teleport, because he can do that. Um... Yeah, she can do that. I, I don't teleportate. Okay. Okay. Both the cartoons and the movie and the specials all introduce the concept that dragons basically run on the rules of the real world. Even if we don't necessarily understand them at the time. But, like, there isn't magic in the dragon world. Um, there are dragons that turn invisible. But they do so in a manner similar to a chameleon. Right. Yeah, uh, there is a shot limit that dragons can have because that's how much of the fire liquid that they can spew at any one time. Similar to how there's a safe limit to how much blood you can donate at any one time. So how is Toothless teleporting? Magic. Actually, that was, that was a little weird when... So we see... Light Fury teleport at one point, and then okay, we I, see... I personally thought that it was... I was about to get there, yeah. Because then later we see her walking around doing, like, translucent chameleon type of thing. Uh-huh. Like, the Predator. Do you know that movie? Yeah, or, um, or Change Wings. Or Change Wings? They were in the cartoon. They are a type of dragon that has acid breath, and uh, they have chameleon powers. Okay. Um, and then, when Light Fury is teaching Toothless to teleport, like, it clearly becomes, no, it's a straight-up teleport. It's not, you went through your own fireball and then turned invisible. Because they move, you know, through space instantly. But then, I swear, there was one shot later on where they did do it the way you thought they were doing it. Where it was just fire, and then I turned translucent for a moment. And I could see the translucentness of the, I don't know what rules they were operating under. Yeah, and... What, so Toothless's rule is that he can't turn invisible, or he can only teleport if he electrocutes himself first? Apparently. He, like, absorbs electricity during the charge-up process? Yeah, but why? I mean, okay, we're, we're thinking, oh, just, god damn it, it just... 
going to have to moving just on. Vaguely moving on. Sexual dimorphism. But the other point I was trying to get to, though, is that she not only teaches him that, but then leads him straight to the hidden world uh, and introduces him to, like, this amazing Pandora esque place off the edge of the map, which is great and all. And an amazing coincidence that she happened to bring him there when, you know, who knows, says that she knows where the freaking thing is at all. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, Hiccup was discussing this earlier, and incidentally, this one random Light Fury also knows where it is and takes Toothless in that same location. Okay, well, I think we have a name for the Light Fury, Plot Convenience. Yeah, <laughs> Plotty McPlot Conveniences. <laughs> so he hangs out there. In the meantime, Hiccup's mother, Valka, Valka doubled back to go check they weren't being followed. And went to go check by herself, even though we have, like, a hundred dragons to spare. But, okay. Yeah, and probably other dragon riders. Uh, so she went back and noticed there is a ridiculously large fleet of ships over here. Like, seriously. there The U.S. Pacific fleet in World War II was not as large as this fleet of ships. I'm pretty sure these things force a collision hazard for each other all the time yeah <laughs> like if there's ever a storm just like ah oh, crap we all hit each other Seriously, like dominoes this is bigger than the grand fleet that the spanish armada convened to try to conquer england oh hell yeah yeah i was... mean if you have this if you have this many ships and this many people why do you give a shit about dragons <laughs> you have enough manpower to take over the world in and of yourself Go invade England. There's an <laughs> occupa- There's an open spot for that at the moment in history. Yeah, by the way, the Spanish Armada was 130 ships. Yeah, this was more than this 130 was at least ships. 500 ships. Yeah, dude. Whatever, I mean, they're exaggerating things because it's cool. But you know, I was just thinking kind of randomly, Grimmel needed a kick the dog moment somewhere in this movie. I would like to see that Armada invading some innocent place, torching shit and, you know, grabbing innocent people and making them slaves or something. And I could be like, oh, now I can feel like I hate you at a personal level, Grimmel. But we never got that. Never he just felt like that. a weenie. He was just like, yes, I'm evil. I'm I mean, evil. maybe they were trying to establish that this is like what Hiccup would be if he had taken the wrong turn in life. They did he... mention that parallel. We'll get to but that. But it wasn't but... very well. It wasn't very deep. And granted, yes, his kick the dog moment is the fact that he's got dragons drugged and they're working for him. But. I didn't get to know those dragons as innocent people before they were transformed into evil people. So I didn't feel it the same way as you would of like, oh no, my best friend has turned against me, you know? So um, anyways, the dragon riders decide to go... Wait, did they go for Hiccup first? Yes. No, no, no. no. They go, they go... Valka goes and, and sees the fleet and then Grimmel lets her get away knowing that Hiccup and his friends will come and investigate and just assuming he won't bring 200 dragons with him. Um, and then Hiccup does come to investigate. Yeah, remember that scene where the Bewilder Beast was attacking Burke, and so Toothless used his King of All Dragons powers to make all of the dragons attack the same target at once, and it drove off the thing. Yeah, the why the, the hell don't we do that? Yeah, seriously, that would have solved all of the problems of this movie. Yeah. Okay. Okay, maybe not the oh. Hiccup and Astrid aren't getting married yet. Problem, <laughs> it but. would solve several problems in this movie. Um, okay, so that Hiccup Oi! just... Oi, Toothless! Now, I need you to threaten all of these here dragons and make them threaten those two idiots into getting married. Can you do that, buddy? So I'll give you a flag and a beer. Instead of a shotgun I, wedding, I don't it's a fireball wedding. Oh, yes. Just like <laughs> they're getting married. And they, it looks the same as the wedding ceremony at the end, except they're looking really scared and all the dragons oh, are perching dear. around with, like, fire in their mouths. Yeah, not a healthy way to start your marriage, but anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. The rest of the shit that they pulled all throughout the rest of the so series. So, the, the Hiccup crew, Strike Force, whatever these people dragon are. Dragon riders. Yeah, I know, but everyone else rides a dragon in Burke. Like, they all, during oh, yeah, the migration... So, I guess maybe the idea is only Hiccup's immediate friends are at all good at combat, but they make them kind of into a joke at combat. Kurt. Cartoon makes it confusing time again. There was a B team in the... <laughs> in the cartoon, there was a B team made of minor side characters who were also dragon riders, who were also training to become, you know, the, the backup, since Hiccup and his friends were typically off the island fighting bad guys far from Burke. Mm. So they should have people like that here. Oh, and if they wanted more security, maybe they should have gone to one of their allies. 
who don't exist apparently anymore in this continuity. Yeah, God, what happened to you Dagger? What happened easy, to Mala? There's an easy kick the dog moment. Oh, the Armada invaded and like kicked the crap out of all our allies, and now we're all alone, and now they're coming for us, and we need to evacuate, and then we see that would have worked. See? I mean, granted, it would have really pissed me off to learn that Dagger and Mala and the Berserkers and the and the Rider Defenders of the Wing and the Outcasts were all dead. I mean, hopefully they were captured, not dead. But you know. well, okay. well, if they're bad guys, they're not going to say we've imprisoned them in the comfy prison. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Anyways, so the Hiccup and his friends go to this ominous tower that he just had, that Grimmel has for some reason. He just has this tower. Did they just happen upon an island owned by Grimmel halfway along their route to the new Verk Island? God. Did they just happen to be along the way? Because <laughs> the tower is not going to exist on the boat. It has to be on an island. Anyway, they sneak uh, in, being all and, stealthy, but Grimmel uh, has the upper hand and, like, traps them there and monologues for a little bit. And he says here, I was like you. I found a Night Fury one day when I was a boy, except instead of saving the Night Fury, I killed it. And everyone and, thought it was really cool. So and, I decided to kill all the other Night Furies in the world. The end. Yeah, that's not a motivation to commit genocide. I mean... It's really... So there's several ways you can take this, right? You could have taken the character in a... Um, if he's lusting for honor and power and prestige, right? And needs to be respected. And he got respect early on. Um, then you could play that into his character where he's, he can't stand anyone's criticizing him, right? One of Eva's, his, his employers, like, makes some comment and he, like, shoves them up against the wall and puts a knife to their throat and says, no one criticizes Grimmel, you know? No one looks down upon Grimmel or something. And then, okay, that's that could be a fairly powerful thing. You know, that's his, his motivation, also kind of his weakness. He wants to be known as the best. Another way you could do it is uh, he honestly believes in this this philosophy he mentions a couple times, that humans and dragons can never live in peace together. That humanity is... And that could have been a great character, because I kind of like these type of characters, because I sympathize with them of him believing in the superiority of humanity over the other races of the world. Especially if, say, I know it's a little cliche, but give him a traumatic backstory where a bunch of his family died because of a dragon attack, which, and he's been bitter about it ever since. Which, granted, that's kind of a common backstory in these story, in the How to Train Your Dragon universe. Yeah, so. Hell, Astrid has that. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, her her dad uh, confronted the Frightmare, and it turns out that he has, it has like a, it emits a chemical that causes fear. Yeah. And so he died alone, in shame, and as a coward. Jeez. Was that in the movies? No, that was in okay. the cartoon. I was going to say. Um, so, yeah, no, that could have been a thing. He, you could even have this interesting bit where he's trying to, like, make friends with Hiccup. Like, I know the dragons have, have tricked you, but they'll turn on you at any moment. You know, I'm here to help. And Hiccup, he would, like, screw you. And then he could be like, well, if, I'll, damn it, I'll just have to kill you all then if, you know, you can't be saved. I, will, I won't let you threaten the rest of the world with your crazy philosophy, you know? But instead, he was pretty chill about it. Like, oh, this silly philosophy of yours of making peace makes no sense. And now I will kill all the Night Furies and possibly all the other dragons. I don't know. It's a little vague what my goal is. Yeah, it's and why? Okay. Can. Now, I got a villain with a simple motivation, it can be done and it can be done well. But generally, you have to because their motivation is so simple. You have to fill in the rest of their character. Okay, let's look at one of the more classic simple villains, Lord Zed from Power <laughs> Rangers. Very simple. Yeah, he wants to destroy all that is good in the universe because he's evil. So card carrying. Villain. That's about it. But we don't complain about his brand of evilness. Because he's so entertaining. He has a force of personality. He looks awesome. He fights the heroes. He summons monsters. You, you, you put in enough stuff around the rest of the character. And just because one area is thin, we don't mind that much. Hmm. But Grimmel doesn't have a whole lot else aside from his I killed all the Night Furies thing. His ultimate, motiva ultimate his motivation is confused. His actions don't seem to be backed up by anything other than, well, why the fuck not? <laughs> and he seems to exist pretty much purely to service the plot. 
Yeah. Because at the end of this film, they have to get rid of the dragons. For some reason, for this some reason. Because this is the time when it takes. Uh, whatever. Um, he's just not very well developed. I mean, Drago Bloodfist was not was also not like. He wanted to conquer using an army of dragons. Fine. That is a great goal. And it's implied it's because, oh, because my family was killed by dragons. But in, in, real, in reality, it's more along the lines of, I lust for power and I am just a conqueror. Mm. But he had enough stuff around him that, again, we didn't mind that much. Also, if they were going to go for the angle of, uh, you and I are not so different. And we came from a similar backstory type of thing. Mm-hmm. You, it's almost required, I feel, that you should use that to challenge the hero's own uh, self-conception in some way. That he, he has to grapple at some point in the plot with maybe, A, the, the villain has a point, or maybe I'm not as good of a person as I thought I was. Because I, I see this this other side of what I could be, and maybe that that's part of who I am, as I, I have that, that same temptation or whatever. But that's right. not what we see. It does not come up in the plot, though. The right. biggest problem that Hiccup has is later on when he's fucked up massively, and his thing is, oh, crap, I fucked up. Yeah, which has nothing particularly to do with Grimmel's backstory. Yeah, so and it's, 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 not, not, it's not thematically it's connected. It's inspired by Grimmel's immediate actions, right, but not but by his not, philosophies or not. thoughts or any of that stuff. Uh, right. Like, remember Dark Knight, right? The yeah. Joker, Agent of Chaos, Batman, uh, Agent of Justice— and they had a very deliberate, overt uh, clash of the philosophies in the climax. Uh, and the Joker believed that almost anyone can be pushed to do evil. And it turned out, no, people do have a heart and they have a conscience and the city is worth fighting for. And it was kind of set up really blatantly in a way, but hey, it was something. And you could see that there was a, a clash of ideas going on and there wasn't as much of that here. Uh, yeah. So anyway, they escape because these immense these these dragons are cool, but they feel really over engineered. The uh, bad guy dragons. They they're made from like a bunch of different dragons from the show. I I feel because they have the acid breath of the change wings. They have the they have venom like one or two other dragons from the show, and they have scorpion tails like the triple strike. So why don't they use those other dragons to show that this guy has, like, a large variety of dragons under his control? Yeah, that might be nice. Simplicity also, sake. apparently, the means by which he control Means by which Grimmel control his dragons is by injecting his dragons with their own venom, which makes it both a knockout drug and a mind control thing. Are we sure that was the same drug? I'm pretty sure it was the same color. Uh, yeah. So, like... How do you tell when it's mind control mode and not sleepy mode? And how do they know who their master is supposed to be? Yeah. Like, is there something in the chemical of the drug that points in the direction of Grimmel somehow? Yeah. You can't anyone just give them orders? Attack! Don't attack! Attack! Don't attack! Shut up! You No, you shut up first! <laughs> shut up! No, you shut up! <laughs> the stuff upon which epics are made. <laughs> Speaking of people needing to shut up, uh, after everyone escapes, somehow they leave Roughnut behind, who is totally chill about it. I was so chill, I was like, wait, was that Roughnut, or was that some other person who was on the bad guy's side? Yeah, um, well, okay, admittedly, I knew, but you aren't as... You didn't... Watch the cartoon? Okay, well, you aren't as religious of a watcher of the of the material, because Roughnut was a character in the first and second movies as well. I know that. The question is, when Roughnut walks into the screen and says, like... I don't know, something really casual. I was like, oh, yeah, why does he always take that baby into battle? And then Grimble's like, wait. It's really you're... irresponsible and making them rattle. I said, I give me a break. Get off my back. Really? Guardian, uh, Guardians Inferno by the Sneepers? Uh, I, I think that's who it's by. It's it's from Guardians of the Galaxy 2. It's, uh... it, it's, the, it's like this this kind of song sung by David Hasselhoff about... The Guardians of the Galaxy in that movie, uh, and one of the lines is talking about it, uh, how the, it's really irresponsible to bring a baby into battles. Talking about baby uh, Groot, I said, "Give me a break, get off my de- back, damn it! I didn't learn parenting. My daddy was a planet." <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's, it's a pretty funny. It's a pretty fun song. I advise. Isn't that's in the end credits or something? Oh yes, it's in the end that credits. That was why maybe I don't remember it as much. Okay, but 
Uh, yes. Anyways. Okay, so, point is, when Roughnut walks onto the scene and says something all casual, and Grimble's like, oh, wait, you're still here. Roughnut was so casual that I went, was that one of our allies that got left behind and for some reason doesn't care the villain is standing right next to her and will clearly nab her in three seconds? Or is that a villainous character who just looks like Roughnut and I didn't know about this other person until just now? Oh, I guess it was Roughnut. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, I like how no one does a head count like five minutes out from the island. Yeah. Huh? They have to wait until they get all the way back to New Burke before they realize, oh, no one's no one realized that she was gone. Which admittedly, they do call Tough Nut out on and like say, "What the hell, dude? How did you not notice?" Right, but you think the rest of them would notice? Yeah, I mean, unless Tough Nut was at the back of the pack the entire way home. Yeah, I mean, the cartoon makes this more confusing again, but this time it's kind of a reasonable thing. Where Rough Nut and Tough Nut were such screw ups and engines of chaos that they required twenty four hour supervision, so you'd think they would check on them really quickly after they escaped. Okay, Rough, Tough, are you here, or did you fuck off to go do something stupid again? I'm here. Hey, where's where's <laughs> Rough Nut? <laughs> yeah. They don't notice until they get all the way back, and then they're like, oh, crap, we gotta go save her. Uh, and then Hiccup, for some reason, is like, I can't do it without Toothless. I'm pretty sure you just escaped capture yourself without Toothless, and... You could probably go save Roughnut with that tooth. I get you'd prefer having him around. I mean, granted, but... as I said to him, I too would also prefer a nearly invisible supersonic attack dragon with plasma blasts. But, you know, you have other dragons. Yeah, there's like a hundred dragons that just never get used the way they should. Yeah, and uh... then, um, but it turns out that uh, Astrid gets a talk from Valka, and Valka says... He thinks he has to do everything on his own. Does he? Because he just led a strike force with several other people in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm not... Into... Also, when he... If he... If he's once Toothless back... I mean, that's... Right there, he's pining for a friend to help him. As opposed to being the tough Viking who says, I don't need friends, I'll do it alone. So I'm not entirely sure what Valka's talking about. Yeah. A different version of the word alone, sort of. I mean, I get and it, kind of, but not fully. And then, for some reason, somehow... Uh, okay, Astrid grabs Hiccup and gets on the back of Stormfly. And then just flies to the hidden world. Because they know where that is now. And they know that Toothless is there, also. Okay, the only way I can square this is by using, again, the cartoon where they recategorize Stormfly from a sharp class dragon, specifically one that has spines and stuff, which admittedly Stormfly does, to a tracker class, one that specializes in. I'm gonna, I know you're gonna be shocked at what I'm about to say. <laughs> making pancakes. Shit, I was actually about to say <laughs> making eggs. <laughs> but no, tracking. So that's the only way I can make this scene make sense. That somehow Stormfly tracks Toothless. Yeah. But other than that, it's never mentioned how the hell they get there. Normally when you're going to track someone with an animal, you have to like give them, you know, that person's shirt or something and they smell it. And you're like, oh, they're going to track him now. Well, Which granted, Toothless doesn't have a shirt to give, but some indication that they were using a tracking ability would have been helpful. Okay, yeah, but admittedly, you know, Stormfly has lived with Toothless for years at this point. Right, or but I'm saying earlier in the movie, you could easily do like... They're hiding some sort of hide and seek for two minutes, and track and uh, Stormfly like can easily find Toothless. They're like, oh, you're out, Stormfly. Your sense of smell has gotten a lot better. You know, you're really good at tracking. And then I would know that this was an option. <laughs> yeah. So they fly down into this hole in the ocean where all the water is pouring in. How does the water get back out? I don't know. <laughs> you know, the last time the ocean did that, it created the Mediterranean Sea. Wait, really? Yeah. So. Do you know how a bunch of ancient cultures have flood narratives? Yeah. Like Noah's Flood and that, uh, what other thing, whatever it was. So there was a flood, but not, like, from the sky raining. What happened was, there used to be a mountain around, mountain range, rather, around the southern tip of, uh, Spain, right? Oh, the Rock of Gibraltar. Yeah, around that area. Um, and it kept the ocean out. And what we know is the Mediterranean Sea was actually dry land. 
<laughs> rivers and <laughs> shit. Crap. And then the mountain like had an earthquake or something, and the ocean started flowing in and started getting faster and faster because of erosion. And over the course of like a few weeks suddenly the whole dang area was flooded and the Mediterranean Sea happened and all the ancient cultures were really freaked out about this. <laughs> and that's how we got Noah. <laughs> that is amazing and I love it. Yeah. But yeah, there's a hole. So shouldn't this hole eventually fill up with water unless there's some sort of volcanic vents that turn it into steam, which actually would work. Yeah, man. Kind, of, kind of like keeping the dragons warm and stuff. But how does air get down here in this undersea cave thing? Was it actually under the sea or just they're at a much lower elevation than the surrounding sea level? Well, I don't, I don't know, but I don't know. Okay. For, for the, the fact that this place is what the movie is named after, we see this place shockingly little. Yeah. This is, a, this is the only scene in which we see the hidden world. Any yeah. other time, we see the waterfall entrance and stuff. But other than that, it looks like we're going into Pandora. Uh, Astrid reaches up to touch a flock of uh, fireworms, which, again, that should cause second-degree burns on her hand. Yeah. And she should know not to do it because she's reprimanded the twins and Snotloud for doing that exact thing. In the cartoons. Yeah, the, I bet you there were some behind-the-scenes discussions about this exact thing, and then some director which was is like, really, yeah, well, whatever. It's really frustrating, because fireworms are from the, the cartoon. cartoon. Yeah, I don't know. Someone played that fast and loose with the canon. Yeah, and it's just... Okay. So they get in there, and by the way, I don't know why the dragons even left the Hidden World. That was never clear. And why their king isn't there. Like, maybe even the previous king was hanging out in the land of the dragons. Yeah, why does it seems like a logical place for him to be hanging out. Yeah, I mean, granted, you'd think an alpha of some kind. I mean, it's clear that bewilder beasts can be alphas and that Toothless can be an alpha. And it was kind of implied that the Red Death, the dragon from the first movie, was an alpha. So why is there not an alpha here? You'd think that, like you said, out of all the places in the world where there could be an alpha... There'd be an alpha now, here. wait a minute. It wasn't... There's... Okay, the Red Death was, like, the queen of that nest, but then the, the Wildebeest was, like, explicitly the king of all dragons, as I recall. Yeah. And then Toothless took that title. But, yeah, why there wouldn't be a local queen, I don't know. And yeah. why the king of all dragons wasn't hanging out in the land of dragons, which is where most of his subjects would be, you would think. Or, or any sort of local control node, you know? Yeah. So Toothless shows up, and uh, everyone instantly recognizes it as king because even though, dragon magic. Even though the Bewilder Beast from the last movie is visible in a freeze frame bonus in this place. I assume that was just a different Bewilder Beast? Hmm. There are species of dragon, subspecies? Well, I mean, several Bewilder Beasts have shown up in the cartoon. Okay. Again. Yeah. God damn it. Um, so uh, Toothless has been hanging out there and being the king, and uh, I guess married Light Fury, who has no name. Yeah, uh, and, and then, um, but somehow a rumble horn sneaks up behind. Uh, yeah, it's a very stealthy rumble horn. <laughs> a rumble horn sneaks up behind Hiccup and Astrid, who somehow don't notice the thing the size of a triceratops sneaking up behind them. Nope, doesn't make any noise. The, that the Jurassic Park scene with I the mean, water didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean the whole. I mean, granted, this whole scene has been very touching because one, it shows. Okay, granted, it shows Toothless kind of being the king of this place. But more importantly, it shows Hiccup realizing, oh, Toothless might not come back after he's been part of his life for so long. Right, and that's a very interesting idea. Wish we did something with that, but... Oh, wait, wait. They do that stuff later. Yeah, they do that later, yeah. Um, so, then anyway, they get spotted by the super stealthy Rumblehorn. And uh, there's a big kerfuffle, and Toothless spots them and, and gets them all to safety and flies them... All the way back to Newburgh. Uh, but seems a little annoyed at the intrusion upon his kingly activities. Yeah, at which point, you know, they get back to Newburgh and then Hiccup goes, I have no rights to take you from that. You should have a life of your own. You should go back to the hidden world. Which I said, well, why couldn't you have told him that, like, at the entrance of this place <laughs> instead of making him fly you back all the way here? Because the plot... <laughs> Plot needed them to be at New Burke. Uh, and the plot suffers a bit, by the way, from the fact that Toothless can't talk. And this has always, you know, it's worked before when 
he only had a, a limited range of ideas needed expressing. But in theory, if you're saying goodbye to your friend who wants to go off and be a king or whatever, you, you need to discuss the whole, will you be back sometime? Or can you help us with this one villain first? Or something. There can't be a back and forth, though, with Toothless, who has no speech. So it's a mean, little harder to get the ideas across. I will grant you that one of the best scenes of Show Don't Tell in all of animation was in the first How to Train Your Dragon film with uh, the hiccup and toothless bonding scene. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, I, not a line of dialogue in that whole right. scene, and the music was amazing. And it would be really weird for him to suddenly be able to talk. I'm not saying they should have done that. I'm just saying the way the plot needed to go and the information needed to go across between these two characters at a couple points was slightly limited by this pre-established fact. Um, and just as he's letting Toothless go, suddenly the light fury is in the grasses over there. But oh no, so is Grimmel, who has his stupid dragon copter drone thing and no one freaking knows. <laughs> I know. I mean, Everything's invisible until the plot says so. I mean, okay. This is especially stupid once you get into the fridge logic aspect of it, where... Burke is building a new society because they just got done running away from the last guys who tried to destroy them. Why do they not have guards? Like on Dragonback, yeah. monitoring the island and making sure that this is their island now and stuff. You know, at least Light Fury is actually invisible, but nobody else is. So nobody how do they is... sneak in? But fortunately, um... Wait, wait, he he Grimmel... darts Light Fury and then he darts, um... The toothless, and then it changed them both up at like hyper speed. Yeah, in the span of uh, Hiccup is running to toothless once he sees Grimmel and realizes that this is a trap, but it's like twelve yards away. In that time, <laughs> Grimmel has managed to dart both toothless and the Life Fury, wrapped them completely up in chains so that they are incapable of escape. Applied muzzles and summoned his dragon copter and his <laughs> dragon minions. And is dragging them both off the edge of a cliff to his copter. Yeah, that was God a damn! Mess. At what point did Grimmel spill chemicals on himself and get hit by lightning? <laughs> yes, Grimmel Flash. My ah. name is Barry Allen, and I hunt <laughs> dragons. <laughs> Jeez, that'd be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then he's got him up on the copter, and he points his gun, crossbow, whatever, at Light Fury. And says to, uh, to Toothless, hey, uh, tell everyone, all the dragons to back off or I because kill your girlfriend. Because all of the Burke dragons, for some reason, knew that everything was going down and all arrived at the exact same time. Yeah. I mean, Which I would I say did... that they noticed the dragon copter, except that it was invisible a moment ago. So What was really confusing about this was I didn't realize that was the Burke dragons until they, the main human character started saying, Oh, how will we follow him without our dragons? Oh, I assumed it was the Burke dragons. They well, no, Burke. I assumed it was the dragons from the hidden yeah, world that, that would followed make sense them. Too. And would have a reason to be there instead of the Burke dragons who were, I don't know what they were doing. Just flying around and not spotting dragon copters. So the Grimmel brings them to his trapper, brings Toothless and the Light Fury to his trapper friends and uses Toothless to put all the dragons from Burke in the cages. And then says, ha ha, ha ha, I'm taking the, the Night Fury and the Light Fury away now. Good luck controlling them, all the other dragons, without yeah. me. What is his attitude towards his employers? Does he want them to die from rabid dragons? Now see, if he had another line immediately following that, unless you'd like to renegotiate our contracts. Yeah, like that he was extorting them, which it wouldn't be that But there's no twist, reason but... for him to do this. I mean, if he wanted to kill Toothless, he could have done it. He had him, like, all chained up. And if he wants to be the ruler of all dragons and make himself a new army, he could have just said that. I don't remember him exactly saying that. What was his motivation? I don't know. Allegedly, to kill Night Furies. Except he doesn't do it when he has the chance. Yeah. Except why does he want to kill Night Furies? And that's never... Ex you know what? I mean, you know, yeah, we're going to keep going really on. touched on. Because all of the main characters now have um, wingsuits like like Hiccup and Toothless had in the last movie. Well, like Hiccup had in the last movie. Which I would accept for most of the cast, except no. No, I do not buy that Fishlegs, who has the body like a sumo wrestler, 
and arm. No, no. He has a body like a Snorlax from Pokemon. Yeah. Down to the proportions, actually. Mm. So, no, I don't think that his wingsuit would actually work. He should plummet to his death. But no, they all land on this army of thousands and thousands of soldiers and trappers on hundreds of ships. And somehow they start fighting and they win the day. And they manage to free Toothless and the Light Fury. Yeah, I mean, some of the other Burke folk also showed up. How they showed up, I don't know. Yeah. They didn't also have wingsuits, did they? They don't have dragons either. They don't have dragons. I don't think they even have ships anymore. They just kind of showed up and like, sorry, we're late. And you go right on time. And then they were fighting. And it was, it was a fine fight as fights go. Uh, but it does raise questions. These are trappers. How many number? I, mean, I do not think that these are Spartan 2s. They should not be able to fight through an army of literally over a thousand trappers on hundreds of ships and destroy the entire armada. I could only You ass- are not Jedi. You are not yeah. Spartans. You have not been subjected to the super soldier serum yeah and also i can only assume it seemed this whole battle's happening on one ship maybe two yeah and there were hundreds and i can only assume the rest of the ships were like looking with their spy glasses like is there something going on over there i don't know i haven't heard any orders <laughs> just kind of hung so around what was the... <laughs> so the bad guys are defeated because we knew they would be and it's i mean there is one moment that i really liked because it had thematic ideas in it, in it um and that is okay so first off uh grimmel drugs light fury i guess just very short term and flies off with her and hiccup falls on toothless and then uh hiccup jumps on grimmel or knocks him around and then grimmel's like hanging off of toothless's uh foot when he's grabbing onto light fury and then Toothless has to let go of Light Fury and says to her, save him, referring to, to Hiccup, has to let go of Light Fury, says to her, save him, referring to Toothless. Uh, and it's, you know, not only a, a possible self-sacrifice, Toothless is more important than me, but also a gesture to his friend's new girlfriend who hasn't liked him at all yet. He's like, I trust you because I trust Toothless and he trusts you. And there was like an interesting relationship dynamic going on there. For and I think that's the moment where she really started trusting Hiccup because yeah. it means that he cares more about Toothless than his own life. Like he right, said. right. So that was that was that was meaningful. I liked it. Uh, and then he's falling all slow mo and Grimmel's like punching him midair and throws his wing to pieces and stuff. And that was neat. And then Toothless saves him, and that was neat. Yeah, I just wish all the stuff building up to that would have been better, you know. Yeah, and eventually Grimmel grabs on to Hiccup's leg and the prosthetic the, leg. Yeah. Hiccup just takes off the leg and Grimmel falls to his death. I guess it's not shown. Yeah, he falls to his the water. Don't show it any further than that. Yeah. Yeah, we can assume that he's de- he's he's definitely dead. And then they all land on the cliff face with all the dragons. And Hiccup says... All of his ships have turned around at some point, I guess. Because <laughs> there were hundreds of ships that must have... They didn't all sink. <laughs> they must have turned around and like, never mind, it's going on. Yeah, so wait, why why didn't they continue on? Yeah, I mean, they could have just kept on fighting. Hundreds of guys. Hundreds of ships. But anyways, all the dragons land on the cliff face and Toothless and Hiccup say... I mean, well, okay, Hiccup says, Oh... It's time for you to go. We, we, you know, we're going our separate ways. It's really touching and tender. And he takes off the harnesses and all the man-made stuff off of Toothless. Which is, you know, exactly what this movie was leading up to. Then everyone else takes all of their crap off of their dragons. Despite, you know, that not being at all necessary, you know, because it's just Toothless who's leaving. If the other dragons want to leave, that's fine, but... Why do all the other dragons leave? They don't have to go anywhere. Well, there's no actual need for Toothless to leave either. His main draw is he's got a girlfriend. She could just stay here for all we know. This is a more so perhaps where the not talking thing becomes a problem. No one's able to explain why they would really prefer hanging out in the hidden world. And, uh, you know, there's no overt obvious reason why they would need that. Yeah, and especially so... since it seems that the hidden world is really close. He could stay here and then just commute. Yeah. Timeshare, man. I, I feel like somebody plotted out, okay, wouldn't it be great if at the end of this, because it's the end of the trilogy, 
they give up the dragons and they have to say goodbye. And that's a lovely idea in the abstract. It's touching. It is perfect for a conclusion. But we're not given a reason why yeah. it didn't happen. You have to give me a reason. There has to be like, oh, we defeated the villain for now, but there's, I don't know, some crazy curse or something that will kill off the dragons unless they go to the hidden world, which is magically protected. I mean, it's implied you know? that the reason that Hiccup says that the reason that they're doing this is because humans will fight dragons you didn't really seem all that like that was a big problem with the other two times you've done this in the movies right. and not to mention in the cartoon there was a whole bunch of people who wanted to do that dragon trappers vigo Riker, dagger uh krogan all of these people wanted to use dragons or hunt them down or kill them for no real reason or because it because dragons are powerful whatever or you know but the point is they fended off all those villains including this villain right here who was distinctly underwhelming compared to you know the tour de force of all those other guys yeah it's like okay maybe if one of the dragons who's our dear friend got killed in the midst of this fighting and you could be like, okay, now things are serious, and clearly we can't guarantee your safety. That would make a little more sense. But nobody died. Nobody even got hurt. You know? So, uh, yeah. The next time this happens, we'll just fight them off again. The end! We win! No need to say goodbye. No, and all the dragons leave, and then it cuts forward to the future where we see Hiccup with a beard. Oh, yeah, they had a wedding in the middle there. Yeah. Oh, there was a wedding, too. Which, yeah, uh, so Astrid and Hiccup finally tied the knot, even though there was absolutely nothing stopping them before. Um, Yeah. And we flash forward and we see Astrid and Hiccup's two kids who are absolutely adorable. Yeah. I mean, I can't even deny that. They are absolutely adorable. As they're on a boat to the Hidden World, and for some reason... Are they even going to the Hidden World? I thought they were just on a boat for random reasons. No, no, they were heading straight towards the Uh, waterfall thing. Okay. Uh, and they run into Toothless, who doesn't recognize Hiccup at first. Because he's got a beard. Mm. Yeah, because beards are like the ultimate stealth technique. Let's just ask Riker. Let's start the track, Riker. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then they go riding on Toothless and Stormfly. Which is a beautiful, you know, reconciliation type of well, reunion. I mean, reunion. reunion. Okay, reunion. better. Beautiful reunion to a breakup that never needed to happen. But if you can just go and ride on these dragons again with no problems, why did you have to give them up? Yeah, why did you have waited like eight years apparently before you said hi to Toothless again? Just do that like all the time, like every week. I mean, granted he's the chief now, but still, if no- He's been the chief this whole time. (laughs) He's been chief since movie two. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I know, but like he can't- Hmm. He could appoint somebody to like be in charge while he goes and takes a- day trip off to the hidden world doesn't seem all that far away yeah so ultimately that was how to train your dragon the hidden world yeah how was it kind of hollow he had some wonderful ideas i could see where they were trying to go with that like i said at the beginning of this uh by the way it had a few other recurring things that didn't add up to much of anything i felt like they were just using up time so tough nut if i'm right yes does this recurring bit of telling uh hiccup how he has to be more manly before he gets married and i guess at the end he's like yeah you're manly enough now but that didn't feel like it was worth our time dude you killed the, this man killed the red death yeah he was the one who inspired the whole revolution of dragon training right. astrid loves him already yeah i could imagine maybe tough nut doing that speech just once and being you know whatever i guess it's kind of funny because he's that dumb but then doing it like three or four times over the course of the movie when it wasn't building anything it was weird they also tried to make a joke out of tough nut going like yeah i'm with him who's with me and then like on the third time he says it he gets interrupted like oh ha ha that's it's not super great of a joke um doesn't say much about somebody's character or something that's interesting or clever uh, it's, it's okay. I'm it's okay. a little more willing to forgive the tough nut lines because yes, T.J. Miller is not a great person, but at the same time, these characters probably got more lines in this film than the other two combined. They might have, yeah. The cartoons did flesh out their characters more, but those aren't indicative of the movies as we've seen from this one. Mm. 
Or maybe they are, and it's just really confusing, and we can't tell. Oh. The third thing was, what's his name, being kind of spooked by hobgobbers, these tiny little dragons? Gobber. Gobber was spooked Gobber was spooked by the hobgobblers. And, like, first there's one of them, and then there's, like, later there's a bunch of them, there's, like, a bunch more. I'm like, ah, it's, I assume this is leading somewhere important. And then the important thing it led to was, during the battle, one of them is shows up and then he's like oh there's a whole bunch of them and they're with me and they're fighting on my side Based for on some what? reason okay they... if this was the bone napper dragon there was a short called legend of the bone napper dragon where the bone napper dragon forged a connection with gobber and that thing looked badass it was a dragon that forged armor out of bones Jeez. it made a rattling noise whenever it walked and it had like a connection with gobber personal history it was cool looking, and it never showed up again. Aww. Which and, and like eventually they got Grump as his dragon, and that thing looks like a beanbag chair. <laughs> if you made a beanbag chair into a dragon, yeah. But so like, I don't know why all these little things that had spooked him in the past no longer spook him, and in fact they're on his side. That made no sense. It's just like they had to have him show up again. So the end of that. Shrug. It just uh, it feels uh, feels like they wanted to get to the point where they were, but it didn't feel like the plot points that got up to there led to each other naturally. Yeah. No. And furthermore, the hit you should have just called this How to Train Your Dragon three. What was stopping you from calling it How to Train Your Dragon three? Because the hidden world only showed up once. It wasn't vital to the end of the book. I have no idea. End of the movie. The book. It was it was only vital in the sense that the dragons went to live there, but they could have gone and lived in a non hidden world, and the plot would have been the same. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't really. Hmm. What even made Hiccup think the hidden world was habitable by humans? They'd never been there at all. Yeah, and the last nests he went to were inside of a volcano and an iceberg. I mean, granted, his mom lived in the nest for the longest time, but that was one oh yeah, human that's the other thing I wanted to yeah, that versus entire village. Yeah. Also, the other thing though, when that the flashback you mentioned, with the dad is saying there's nothing more important than love, really just dr- twisted the knife a bit on her completely nonsensical abandonment of the family. Like, apparently, what did she not think that love was important enough to come back, even though he thought it was the most important thing in the world? And yeah, he never remarried, and you know that would have been important for the chieftain of a village, especially only when he has one kid. And you, you know, fuck, you ought to have a long lineage and many children, and make sure people will succeed you and all that stuff. Yeah, not that they're trying to be historical to the Vikings here, but I'm just just saying. there would be pressure outside. You know, polit- he would be open to political marriages, which makes it all the more impressive. All the more impressive that he stayed single, even when he could have been married off to someone else. Yeah. He could have deliberately married in order to unite a tribe or something. And people could have tried using that against him. Especially when Hiccup was considered a wimp. <laughs> you know, hey, have you tried having a different child? <laughs> Who could, maybe that person could be the chieftain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, that, that puts, that puts his whole thing into a new light. He, his crying over he will never take another wife, every time he was disappointed in Hiccup and thinking, this is my heir, he will never get another chance. Because he will never take another mate. Another wife. Which is, would, you know, is a lovely idea. It just doesn't add up with the plot of number two, and they didn't think of that through at all. Uh... Look, this movie has great moments. Yeah, great animation, certainly. That's why I said at the beginning, I wish I'd yeah, seen it in theaters. I, I really don't think we should really say great animation anymore, because it's all great animation. I mean, I mean, should... like, this was more impressive than some of the recent stuff I've seen. Okay, yes, fair enough. It's just that generally studios are going to put out really good-looking shit. Yeah, because that's, that's the easiest thing to budget for. <laughs> just put more money into this until it all shines and all the physics effects are done and all that. Yeah, but... <laughs> It looked pretty. It had great moments. I mean, again, I say that Astrid and Hiccup's family is adorable to the nth degree. Sure, they are. Uh, the moments where Toothless left, adorable. The um, 
Toothless wooing the Light Fury by drawing her picture in the sand. Yeah. It's a nice callback to the original uh, friendship, forbidden friendship scene. It's just that these moments aren't connected together in a meaningful way. Yeah, no, they're not. Uh, we've already speculated how we would have changed it. They have to leave Berkeley. Give them a reason. Plot. Thank you. Yeah. Make our villain more motivated and more interesting. And if he's going to be a reflection of Hiccup, play on that reflection. Have Hiccup learn a lesson. If Hiccup's learn lesson is going to be learning how to let your friends go and accept change, make me a villain who can't let people go and can't accept change, you know, and, and that ties into his villainy. And Hiccup has to eventually tell him, no, you're wrong. And not just wrong in the midst of this battle, but also wrong in the broader sense of how I need to let Toothless do his thing and be different and not be so clingy and all this other stuff. It just didn't add up, you know. Mm -hmm. that, that, that. It adds up to not adding up. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Oh, good, good. That, that makes perfect sense. Just as much sense as this movie. <laughs> no, it makes more sense. It uh, makes wait, more wait, sense. No, I mean, the movie makes sense. Just not thematic sense. No, even yes. the logical sense didn't make too much sense. A logical sense. It's not too bad. The tactics didn't make sense, and the themes weren't built up the way they right. should be. But at least it was better than Rebuild 3.33. <laughs> it's hard to be more confusing than Ava. That is at a least high I bar, tell, I can clear. Well, at least I could tell what the fuck was going on here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's not that's not a high... It makes more sense than Ava 3.33. <laughs> that's not a high bar. That's a tripping hazard. I'm pretty sure that Delirium is a, of the Endless would... Uh, that is a, we need to call out, we're planning on doing some digging here, so we need to call in the gas line, the gas people to say, okay, this is where the pipes are, <laughs> yeah. type of hazard. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we've said everything we need to say about I this movie. I think we have. Um, okay, so, I'll talk to you guys later. Um, yeah. I'm Sith King. I'm Sarkson. Signing off. <laughs>